Okay, well, hello everyone. Good afternoon, thank you all for coming. My name is John Sarudakis, so as many builders in this uh, call me, the guy with a weird last name. I heard that just a few hours ago, so that was a great booster for, the, for this uh, talk. So I'm a program manager in the Bing team, and it's really my pleasure to have with me today here Ryan Galgan and Mike Hall from our technology and research team. So we'll be your host for the next 60 minutes, and we're thrilled to talk about our newly announced cognitive services. All right, so as you probably heard Satya saying yesterday, and if you attended the Hari Sham session today, earlier today, we believe that the next wave of experiences will be more natural, more personal, and ultimately more human-like, which is why we launched cognitive services a comprehensive collection of intelligence and knowledge APIs, 22 uh, in total, to empower developers and businesses build smarter apps and experiences for the next decade to come. Experiences that can see the world around them, hear and speak back with users in a natural way, understand natural language, in fact, in many languages, even be able to reason by embedding knowledge from different sources, your, the web, academia, your own source, in order to find connections and associations between concepts and entities of our real world. And finally, last but not least, provide instant answers from the web with the knowledge and intelligence of being. Now, as I walk you through all these cognitive services, I want to highlight that Despite the serious name of our cognitive services, we are not limited to serious applications. So we released several fun apps to showcase a few things that we can do with cognitive services very recently. Starting with our caption bot, an intelligent service that you can provide an image and it will describe, it will attempt to caption it intelligently through its eyes and even, even understand the people that are in the image through our entity graph. We have another one called Celebs Like Me that we launched uh, a, about a month ago. It's a fun app that shows you your closest celebrity match based on visual characteristics. Right? You see Steve Ballmer, how, how he looks like uh, Anthony Hopkins. After seeing that, I could not unsee it, actually, to tell you the truth. And last but not least, our Murphy. Our, it's a new bot that we just launched today. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an intelligent app that tries to augment human imagination by visualizing what-if scenarios, right? So in this case, what if Satya had a very long beard? That's how he would look like. So there's a full-up catalog of cognitive services to view, and uh, in many cases also get the source code. So I, I, I encourage you to also look at our cognitive services site. Uh, I will give you the URL a few uh, slides later. Okay, so uh, just developer to developer, the, all the APIs that we have in the cognitive services are RESTful, which means ultimately for you that uh, they are available cross-platform and they work across any language, any framework, any platform of choice, right? So you can easily integrate them into your experience uh, with the tools you're familiar with. But more importantly, as a key takeaway for you, all the experiences that are part of the cognitive services package or is, are tested in the field and at scale, right? They represent a collection of state-of-the-art artificial intelligence technologies developed by experts in Microsoft Research, Bing, and Azure. And they're widely used in many, many popular Microsoft products as well as third-party uh, experiences. And just a, another highlight before we close this slide, even though as I said, these services are developed by experts. They're not reserved for experts. So you don't need any background in machine learning or artificial intelligence to use them, right? And we intend to show that today by pulling some of these together into an actual application. All right, so here is a view of cognitive services with all the APIs and service names listed. Some of you probably recognize some of these names as being a part of uh, Project Oxford that we launched uh, last year, and the, Bing pu the public Bing APIs that we had available uh, in the past. 
Well, let me be clear with you that this is not a simple rebrand of existing services, right? Since last year, we uh, made significant updates. We added new ones, new services that made sense as part of bringing together uh, cognitive services. And in fact, we brought three families of uh, services together. We brought the Project Oxford as well as new services uh, that are fit into the Project Oxford, Oxford portfolio. We brought together, uh, we brought as well Bing APIs as well as Translator. Now, we only have 60 minutes ahead of us, actually fewer than 60 minutes, and in the interest of time, we are going to focus on the highlighted services. Of course, you can learn more and explore these services as well as sign up for free to start using these services in the URL that you see here, microsoft.com slash cognitive. And in fact, if there is one thing to take away from this presentation, it's this URL. For the rest, you can actually find all the information that you need online, okay? So, let's start with the first topic of today, which is Bing. Now, in a few years, Bing has become the preferred knowledge and intelligence engine that powers several features in many popular Microsoft products, like uh, Cortana, Office, and more recently with uh, Conversation as a platform, the, the recent announcement, Skype. We're also extremely proud to be partnering with several of the top industry leaders, like Apple, AOL, Amazon, and Yahoo, who are using, who are trusting Bing as the search provider for several of their offerings. And today we are excited to announce that we are making the same technologies that power Bing.com and a lot of our, the partner experiences that I just presented as part of Cognitive Services. So we're launching Search API V5, Search APIs V5, uh, four public search APIs to search across hundreds of billions of documents, as well as our auto-suggest and spell check services to help your users complete their search task faster. Now, all APIs represent first-class citizens in our ecosystem of services. What do I mean by that? They receive the same relevance updates and have the same high level of reliability, performance, scale, and support as the rest of our premium experiences, okay? So they also comply, and I, this is a, 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 a call out that I would like to make also, is that they comply to open data schema standards like schema.org and optionally JSON-LD, which means ultimately for you that it's easier to plug them into your experiences as well as extend. Now, a few things, just a couple of feature call outs for the new APIs and then we'll switch to the demos. Starting with the Web Search API. Right, the Web Search API is our main search API that unifies the different result types returned by B. So with one call, a REST call, a GET call, you get back relevant web results, news results, images, videos, and related searches, right? This is, for instance, the example, the example results from Bing.com and what you would get from the API for the query NASA. And you can also get, uh, see a collapsed view of the JSON blob you expect to receive back. Notice also the last node called ranking response, right? This is a new feature in our search API, which does what? It's actually pretty interesting. It gives you hints in order to optimally place the different result type modules on your page layout with the goal to optimize your, the overall click-through rate of the results, right? Es essentially uh, on that given uh, that particular query. And this is really data that is based on uh, um, signals that we collect from hundreds of millions of users on a monthly basis. And of course, while it's optional for you to use it, it's highly recommended by us to do so, okay? So, switching to the vertical search API. So, besides the, ver the web search API, we have three more vertical search APIs. And uh, one would ask, you would ask, uh, why uh, do you need additional search APIs? Be since I just told you that with the web search API, you get back all these result types anyways with one call. Well, it goes without saying that given we know that the user intent, given we know the user intent is, for instance, to search videos or images, we can provide more results 
and more features and metadata tailored to that result type. Okay? So let's see a couple of features that we have that are new in the new uh, uh, Search API v5 family. So for images, for instance, one of my favorite ones, uh, we today in the new API we give you far more results, essentially what we call more insights on the images. So now you can get back entities depicted in the image. So for instance, if there is an image of Satya Nadella, we tell you, hey, it's Satya Nadella uh, in the picture. We also give you some, uh, some very powerful capabilities that you can embed uh, into your app, like visually similar search. So given, for instance, a product, red shoes, a product search, a query, we give you back relevant, sorry, ex uh, results that are uh, related, not just uh, with, b related to the query that you just searched, but also related to the, by visual similarity, okay? So switching to the video API, uh, so the video API uh, itself as well comes with a lot of enhanced uh, metadata and filters to customize the results. And one of, my favorite one, uh, one of my favorite features is something that we call motion thumbnails. Essentially, it's a 30-second video preview of uh, the video results, of each video result. And it's essentially a good summarization of uh, the video result brought to you as a thumbnail that you can embed uh, and keep your users um, um, ins inside your app. Now, finally, the news API comes with its own set of uh, search capabilities. So with the new API, you can get, you have more flexibility to search for trending news or trending topics around the world and get deeper insights on articles. So a new feature, for instance, will, of the new API is uh, something that we call featured entities. So we tell you, given a specific article result, what are the entities, people, things, or places that are mentioned into the article, all right? So with that, let's actually switch to the demo, but first one key, call out, uh, accessing all the APIs, and this is not restricted to just the Bing search APIs, but really it applies to most of the cognitive services. Uh, so accessing the APIs is actually very simple. You just obtain an API subscription key from the Microsoft.com slash cognitive site, and then you just call our REST endpoint by, and pass the key, the subscription key that you just got via a special header. You can see it in the screen, and you will uh, see it in, in the instructions online. All right? So without further ado, let's switch to the first demo for tonight, which is eight. All right, so before I actually switch to the code, I would like to do a very quick stop to the cognitive services site and show you what I just described in the previous slide. So this is the main, the main site for all the cognitive services. You can see if I expand the API uh, menu, you will see all the 22 APIs that we offer today. Uh, and as I said again, you can get started for free uh, just by subscribing uh, to uh, the site. You just click on Get Started Today and you start the registration process. You follow the on-screen instructions and it usually, it, it usually takes 30 seconds to one minute, so it's super fast. All you need is a Microsoft uh, account, like an Outlook.com account. So uh, as you do the, as you go through the registration process, we will ask you to, uh, excuse me, there you go, we will ask you to select which services you're interested in, right? We, which services you want to subscribe to. You can select all at once, obviously. And finally, once you finish the registration process, you'll end up in this subscription page that will have for each uh, service a key that you can use, as I said, to pass to our APIs and get uh, access to, to our data. All right? So with that, let's actually see some real code, right? That's why we're here. So let's switch to Visual Studio and show you how easily you can uh, integrate Bing Search into your apps. Now, before we jump into the code, I would like to show you the app that we want to build in its current state and what we want to achieve, OK? So our goal for this section of the talk is to embed search results into the app, as you see here on the left side. You see a search box and some search pivots, okay? So that's our goal. 
notice here that on the right side we have some additional controls that will be used by uh, Ryan and Mike uh, to add some additional intelligence, let's say, on top of the knowledge that we get, on top of the results that we get uh, from uh, the, um, the search APIs. Okay? So, let's switch to the code and let me do a quick walkthrough first. Now, we just have a few constants and a few lists defined. So the constant just stores the uh, Bing API key that we got from the cognitive services side. And then each list is an observable list that will uh, store the different result types that we get from the search APIs. And eventually this list will be uh, bound to a XAML control uh, in order to show the results in the UI, right? Our main um, function will build the search function, which is right now defined as a, as a search task because we'll call the APIs asynchronously, asynchronously since we don't want to block the main execution thread. So it doesn't do really anything now. It just clears the previous results and selects, uh, you know, either switching to a different search pivot in the UI or, or, st or sticking to the current one. So let's go through the steps. We're to really talking about a dozen lines of code uh, to start getting results back. So all I'll do is first, actually, let me maximize, sorry. All we do first is uh, define uh, the endpoint that we'll hit. Uh, this is the main web search API endpoint. Uh, all the, the query parameters that I have are just a query that we want to uh, get results for, as well as a count parameter that says, instructs to the API to just give me max 10 results. Okay? Next, some variables. Now, as I said, uh, the search API and most of the cognitive services APIs are REST APIs, so you're free to use your own preferred method to call uh, a REST API. For, for this example, I'm using HTTP client, and I'm passing two uh, request headers, one for the key, right? The key that we defined earlier here as well as just an accept header to instruct, to inform the API that we expect to get back JSON results. And then I have two more variables uh, to store the raw response and the deserialized JSON response into uh, a strongly typed object called Bing, J Bing search response. Now, finally, I'm, I'm doing the uh, async call using get string async and I'm deserializing, so this will essentially give, uh, get the results from the JSON endpoint and store it uh, uh, in, uh, in our, our string variable, so everything will be just a raw string. And then we'll use the deserialize object that is part of the uh, NewtonSoft JSON package, very popular package that you can get in Nugget, to deserialize the response and store it uh, in the uh, strongly typed object. Finally, and we're almost done actually, all I have to do after I get this, if I, ha if I, if I actually added a breakpoint here and compiled uh, and run, uh, what you would see is just a, str a strongly typed object that, uh, object that has JSON data that resembles a lot the data that we get back from uh, that, the JSON blob that I showed you earlier. Okay? So, uh, oh, I'm iterating the results, storing them in the list, and then finally, in the observable list, and then finally binding the list to uh, the uh, corresponding grid view control in XAML. And we're done. I'm hitting save, control F5. And then let's say, hello API world. And hopefully we'll get back results but we don't. Okay, so we got it. So the first one failed. Unfortunately, we had some uh, Wi-Fi connections issues uh, earlier as well. So let me type quickly one of the queries that I would like to show you. So NASA is the example I used uh, in, uh, in, in my slides. You can actually see NASA being returned as one of the top queries. Uh, now, a, a quick call out about the web results is that all the, all the APIs are location aware which essentially means that uh, they are, the relevance is customized according to the market of the user or the caller of the API. So given that we are in San Francisco right now and I'm typing 
I'm querying for space agency, then I, we understand that your intent is to probably find NASA. But if you were to query the same term uh, in Russia, let's say, then you would, we would return the space, uh, the Russian F Federal uh, Space Agency. Now, moving on to uh, other e result types. We saw web results, but then we have image results, as well as videos and news. And I'm actually copy-pasting quickly the code because it's really similar to what I did for web results. So I, again, get my uh, images object from the JSON response, store it into a temporary object, add it to a list, add it to the list, the observable list that stores the image results, and then finally bind the results, uh, bind the list to uh, the corresponding grid view control. And I'm doing the same thing for videos as well as news. So a lot of repetitive code. So if I hit Control F now and uh, build, as you saw, really takes just a couple of minutes to, call, to complete the process, right? So let me, let me call Steve help us out for this query. So Steve developers, and hopefully, there you go. We got Steve Baumer. This is how I was sweating 30 minutes before the uh, presentation, so I totally feel uh, Steve at this point. Now, the a quick call out is that I, don't even, I didn't even define Steve Balmer, right? I just figured out that based on the relevance that we have, that Steve Balmer and developers, a query together, is actually the most appropriate one uh, for, this, um, uh, for this query. And really now, with just a few lines of code, our app has opened a window uh, to the world. So it can, it can travel from the distant Sahara to the snowy Alps, right? And I'm Greek, so I, I'm biased, and I will also search for Santorini. And as you can see, right, with just a few lines of code, we managed to get all these different result types, web and images, and I'll show later on videos and news, uh, quickly and easily and under, under a second, really. So one, uh, one other thing, one other call out that I would like to make is that with Bing, you don't get just knowledge. We're, we're not just keywords, and that's something that I want you to internalize. Because we, a lot of our focus uh, is based on actually understanding your intent to give you the most appropriate re results, the most relevant results, tailored to your needs. So if, for instance, you search for uh, tallest peaks, right, something a bit blurry, something that a machine would not easily get, uh, you will see that we did not just return any pictures of a mountain peak. We understood that you want to get images for the tallest, the images of peaks for the tallest mountains, and we uh, did a lot of inferences in the background and gave you the latest, the, the top results. All right. So we're running out of time a bit, so let me just quickly go to videos and news to show you a couple of things, and then I'll hand it over to uh, Ryan. So for videos, uh, the, one of the new things that we got is, as I told you, uh, video previews, more motion thumbnails. So if I'm searching for nature time lapse, I get back these results. Now the cool thing about these results is that each thumbnail is Obviously a video, 30 minute with a video with audio and 30 minute, a 30 second preview. And this one is really a summarization, a nice and intelligent summarization of the whole video. So we return that, it's stored in our cloud server and you can easily embed that into your app. Finally, news. Okay, let me stop that. Finally, news. With, again, a few lines of code, you can embed all the freshest news inside your app and keep your users engaged. So if we search for Microsoft Cognitive, for instance, we'll get the latest news about cognitive services as they come, really. As Bing.com sees them, you will see them uh, as well. All right, so we run out of time. We, sorry, Ryan, I was a few minutes late, but uh, I'll pass the baton to you right now to show how you can add some additional intelligence on top. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Uh, there we go. 
All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Ryan Galgan. I'm a program manager in technology and research, and I'm gonna add on quickly to the APIs that John just showed you and extend the app with two additional services from Microsoft Cognitive Services, specifically our language understanding service and computer vision. So you've heard a lot about bots and kind of natural user interfaces this week. Uh, Lewis is a key part of that. So what you can see here is that when someone comes in and queries about news about flight delays, uh, on the right-hand side, we end up coming back and describing, well, the most popular or the most likely intent for this is find news, and the entity is flight delays. Now, whether it's speech or natural text that's being typed in to say something like Skype, there's many different ways to ask with the same intent and the same entity. And instead of having to worry about how you end up parsing all of those intents and entities to the same thing, Lewis lets you get started really quickly and easily so that you don't spend your time uh, building different parsing methods, you spend your time focusing on your app logic. We launched Lewis last year, um, and we've been adding features since then. Uh, two key ones that I'll call out because they've been frequently asked for. Uh, we've continued to add new languages over time. Recently, we added Italian, French, and Spanish support, so now we're up to five. Um, and then the other thing to call out is that uh, all of these things actually have a programmatic API, which we launched recently for Lewis. So I'm gonna be showing everything from the web interface, but everything I see there, um, know that there's a way to do that via an API behind the scenes. Our computer vision API, which we also rolled out last year, uh, we released the version 1.0 of it this week. One of the key features was categorizing or tagging images. Uh, we went from roughly 100 tags to over 2,000 tags. Um, and once you have that many different ways of describing the image, you then get to do something like generating a natural language description for it. Uh, this is something that you probably saw demoed on stage by my colleague Cornelia yesterday with captionbot.ai. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna take these two services and wire them up into the application. And the first thing that I'll do is I will go and I will start building a Lewis model. I'll give it a quick name here on Lewis.ai, say search demo. And in Lewis, two of the key concepts to understand are intents and entities. Intents are an action that you wanna take and an entity is the object upon which you take those actions. So when John was showing all the search APIs, one of the examples would be searching for images. That would be one intent. Another example would be searching for news. That's a separate intent. And in both of those, they're gonna have a query. So in this case, we'll say, maybe my query, I will call it a topic entity. And then for uh, finding images, we'll say something like find images, find photos of Seattle. All right, so what I just typed in there for find photos of Seattle, that's an example utterance. These are how you expect users to interact with your application, whether that's them typing it in text or what you expect the speech to text conversion to be. And in the main part of the page here is where you'll spend most of your time in Lewis. So you'll, there's two key parts. One is this little dropdown, which contains all of your intents. You can see it's already selected find images here. And the other part is the utterance, where in this case, I'll say Seattle's the topic. So you can imagine here that I'll match find images to the image search API that John just showed, and Seattle will pass in as the query. So I'll click Submit. Maybe another one would be Show Photos of San Francisco. And then in this case, I will say that Find Images is the intent, and we'll tag San Francisco as the topic. All right, then the next thing that I'm gonna to wanna to add to my application is being able to describe uh, the image with the computer vision API. But I'll have a list of images, and I wanna be able to select one of them out of that list. So selecting an item or recognizing the uh, item specified in a list is a pretty common task. So we have a set of pre-built entities here which will save you time. So here's an ordinal one, uh, which will automatically identify first, second, third, and so on. So I'll add that, and again, this will be a new intent. So I'll say my intent is, select image, uh, tell me about the first photo. All right, and what you can see here is that as it processes, first should hopefully already be selected by that ordinal pre-built entity, and it's set to select image. Describe the photo as another example. Again, select image, second is already picked you get a sense of the kind of iterative nature that you use to build a Lewis model here. 
Now, the last thing I haven't mentioned, you might have noticed that there's this none intent. Um, this was there when I started the application. So anything that's outside of the domain or that you haven't actually mapped to uh, any of your intents will end up mapping to the none case. So here I'll just submit that and say that that's none. So I've typed in five example utterances, and you've noticed in the bottom left-hand corner that it started training a new model for me already. So that's enough to get started. Uh, it'll finish training the model, and once that finishes, I'll get it deployed up to a web endpoint. We'll just click Publish here. And now I'm ready to go. I can hit this either with text or this integrates seamlessly with our speech APIs. So now we could say something like, find photos of build. And you can see here that it's ended up giving me this nice JSON response. It says, find images is the most likely intent, both giving me a very high uh, confidence score as well as being the first item in the list. And it's automatically selected out the entity um, of a topic being billed. All right, so now we'll go into the application and get that all wired up. So the first thing that I'm gonna need to do is I'll want to deserialize this response. So let me switch over here. So I think it's this one that I need. And I will switch over to my Lewis class that we've pre-built. So I've got that JSON response and I will use the incredibly handy paste JSON as class feature. And you can see that I'll have an array of intents, an array of entities, which will just make it much easier to work with. Give that a slightly friendlier name. And now, when I want to go parse this, I will start off with doing the same kind of uh, HTTP client uh, request that John had showed earlier. All right, so switching back to my example uh, Lewis model here, you'll notice in the URL that I have an application ID and a subscription key. So this specifies the appropriate account for making the request. And I'll get that put in as the URL that we're going to hit. Okay, so now I'm getting back my JSON response. So the next thing to do will be to deserialize it. And you can see that I get back uh, an intent. I'm just pulling out the very first intent in the list. As I showed before, the first one is always going to be the most confident one. And so now I know what the intent is. And because all the different ways that I could ask for finding images or, say, finding news are going to be mapped to the same intent, um, I can feel confident that all I need to do is just switch on that and match it to the appropriate search vertical that John had showed before. So no matter if I'm asking for photos or images or pics, whatever, um, they'll all get mapped to the find images intent. I'll pull out the entity. So I have an array of entities that comes back. I'm just going to join all of them. You'll notice I'm picking out the one that I labeled as topic. And so now I've got the query. So I'll be able to say, OK, it's an image search. So switch to the image intent, take the entity, and pass that in as a query. And last but not least, I will uh, wire up the select image section. This is very similar to how I pulled out the entity top, uh, the entity where it, I had called topic. In this case, you'll notice I'm matching on built-in ordinal. Um, there you go. All right. So that is having Lewis all wired up. And now I'll show how easy it is to pass that off to image captioning. So here you can see I've already specified my API key for the computer vision API. And in this case, rather than using HTTP client to make the request, I'm actually going to be making use of uh, a NuGet package. So for just about all of the APIs, we have a set of NuGet packages published. It makes it much easier to work with them. We've got a set of helper functions that just lessens the amount of code that you have to write. So with the NuGet package now, I can say that my result is going to be as simple as calling the client. And you can see that I've got helper functions for analyzing the image. I've got helper functions for actually describing text that's within the image, things like that. But in this case, I'm captioning. So I'll call the describe function, pass in the URL. And I'll just take the, the first caption out of the list um, and return that back. So now, if I've done my job correctly and I run this application, it should be all wired up. So show photos of Seattle. 
There we go. So what's happened here is it's gone up to the Lewis model, taken that string of text, uh, identified that it's an image search, set to the appropriate pivot, pulled out Seattle as the topic, and plugged that in. And I can say, uh, tell me about the first image. And this should now be selecting the first one out of the list um, and passing that over to the computer vision API. So that's how easy it is to take Lewis, add natural language processing, and combine that with the Bing image results and run that through the computer vision API to get a natural language description. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Mike, who's gonna add in the power of translator. Bonjour. <laughs> I thought that would be appropriate for this part of the, uh, the session where we talk about translator. Okay, so now let's start to talk about translator as part of this session. There are two parts of this that we're going to be talking about. Uh, the first part is translating speech. But actually, that's going to be the second part. And this is a new API which many of you may have already used inadvertently by using Skype Translator. Has anyone seen or used Skype Translator for language-to-language -language discussion? Okay, a few people in the room, so that's great. The rest of you need to go out and use it as well. So the, the first thing that I'm actually going to talk about and show isn't necessarily new, but it's still very relevant for the, the kind of applications that are, people are building day-to-day. How many of you have used Facebook or Twitter or any of these other app applications that might be very social and discussion-based? Okay, I'm pretty sure in most of these kind of applications, you'd have seen people that are on your friends list or that you've subscribed to where they've posted something in a different language and you've seen the translate tag next to it so that you can translate that text into something that you can read. So we have a translator API. It's been around for a little while. It is probably the best translation model that exists because it exists at multiple levels. The first of which is simply the ability for you within your application to make a call to the API and translate from and to any of the 50 languages that are supported. There is also a highly customizable translation model here. We have something called Translator Hub. This gives you the ability to do one of two things. The first of which is if you're working in a field that has fairly technical content or content that is fixed into a, into a field like medical or, or something similar, you can train a translation model based on content that is specific to the domain that you're working in. The third part of this is the ability for you to work with humans to enhance or improve the translation model that's been created. So you get much better results out of the translation. There are a number of interfaces onto this API, including Ajax, REST, and SOAP. What we can see here is a list of the various APIs that are supported. Translate's the obvious one. Detect is kind of interesting, and we're going to be using this as part of the uh, API set that we're going to be calling in the application in just a second. So what you can see is that you know, there's obviously a number of different APIs that you can use inside of your application to support translation. So what we're gonna be doing is enhancing the application that John and Ryan have already shown you. This is the application here. What I'm going to do is just launch the application so you can see what the application looks like with some of the translation features built in. What you'll see across the top of the screen is this FR inside of a combo box. And if I drop this down, this has been populated by the list of supported translation languages from the Translator API. So there are two different APIs that I can call here, one of which is to get the short form version of all of the supported languages, and the second is to make a call to get the long form version, like English or French or German or whatever else. So I've populated this list when the application initializes to build in that list of supported languages. Next to that is a translate button. In a second, we'll dig into the code and find out what's behind that. So what's gonna happen here is I'm going to search for something uh, using the excellent work that John and Ryan have already put into the application, thank you. And then what we're going to do is real-time translate the text of the results that we get back 
into a language that we choose from the list. So I'll show you this working first, and then we'll dig into the code behind to find out just how easy it is for you to hook this up inside your application. There's something to note about translation, though. Translation isn't straightforward, right? Many languages have words that are you know, the other way around or switch genders or, or whatever else, right? So when you think about translation, it's not purely word for word for word for word. There's also understanding and intent that forms that as well. If you were to ask two professional translators to translate the exact same document, the chances are you'll end up with different results from each of them, right? So this it just gives you some impression of how hard this kind of stuff is. Okay, so uh, let's, I'll show you this working first and then we'll go take a look at the code. So let's search on something that I think is fairly relevant uh, right now, and that'll be something like Boaty McBoatface. Is, is that a good term to search for? Yes, okay, good. Right, so I'm gonna hit search, and yes, there we are, we get the results back, so that's a tick in John's box there because we got the results back for John, right? And I should be able to also click into news and, and get a list of trending or you know, news articles as well. Okay, so why don't we just do the translation? I'm gonna hit the translate button, and what this is gonna do, we'll, we'll see the code behind in just a second, but what this is gonna do is reach out to the translation service it's going to detect the language of each of the items in the list of returned results for search and news, and it will translate only the subtext here, not the title, right? And the reason why I'm doing that is to show that the topic itself is remaining the same. We could obviously translate the title as well, okay? Just to show you that that's also being applied onto news, I'll click news and you can see that um, you know, that's there as well, right? Amazing, right? But wait. <laughs> okay, let's go take a look at some of the code. Okay, so in the application, we've obviously got this translate button. If I go and have a look at the code that sits behind this, what we see in here is that I'm getting the list of the count of the number of items that are in the web results pivot. And what I'm doing is setting the snippet, which is the subtext within that article, to a call into a class that's part of the application called translator. And we'll take a look at how that gets initialized and how the API is used in just a second. Translator.translate, and then we pass in the initial language, uh, the initial text for that article, followed by the language that we want to translate that article to. Right? So you can think about this as being a string result, the string input and the language choice that you want to translate to. You can actually pass in to and from, but we're actually using a different API. We're using an API inside of the translate class to detect the source language so we don't need to pass to and from into the translate API. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Right, so that's what we're doing on the uh, web results, but we're actually replicating the exact same thing for the Bing news, trending news results as well. Right, so it's the exact same code. What you'll notice is that there is a difference here between snippet for web results and description for the trending news results. Um, and that's the only real change between these two things. The underlying code is exactly the same. Right, so let's go take a look at the translator class because this is where the, the translator work is happening. So very much like the, uh, the work that John was showing you earlier, we do need an authentication token. Uh, we need to uh, generate that every 10 minutes. Uh, we've got code samples online on MSDN that show you how to do this. Um, I think we're also gonna post this sample online to show you how to use both the Bing uh, the uh, Lewis and, and actually the translator API, so you can, you can pick this up and see how that works. Okay, so here's the translate call. What are we doing? We're making sure that the length of the input string uh, is more than zero, great. Uh, we're then making a call to detect language, which we'll take a look at, at in a second. Uh, and we're using the return from that as the from language and taking the to language, which is passed in from that combo box, within the application. 
So that's pretty, pretty straightforward. We URI escape the input string that we want to translate, because obviously there will be things like spaces and exclamation points and these kind of things in the string that we want to translate. And then we make uh, an HTTP REST call out to the translator service, passing the authentication token in as part of the call. When we get the results back, we simply walk the uh, XML data that we get returned, pull out the string from that, and then return that back to the user. So that's pretty straightforward. For initialization of the class, we pass in the uh, authentication keys that are required to build the token and then go and generate the token. There's a fair amount of work in there. It's pretty straightforward. It's documented on MSDN. So I'm not actually going to spend any time walking through that part of it. In order to detect a language, this code should look very similar. And obviously, we're using this as part of the translate function. We're passing in the string. We're getting the, the language back. We're calling the, basically the same endpoint. Uh, we're passing in the API that we're interested in, which is shown here, which is detect. We're passing in the escaped string, uh, passing in the access token, um, and then making the call, parsing the XML, and then passing the results back. This is the call to get all the languages. This returns a list of languages that we then use to populate the combo box back in the application. Again, this is fairly straightforward. We make a call to this API. This will return an XML document to us. And all we need to do is basically just read uh, through that XML document and add each of the items into a list that we then return back to the user. So that's pretty much it. Making, making use of the translator APIs is pretty straightforward. You can see just how easy it is to add support for translation into your application, right? Great. OK, so that's the translation part. Who would like to see a technology that we've released 200 years before it should have been released? <laughs> Not a single hand went up. I can't believe it. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming. I guess that's the end of the session. OK, so the thing that I'm going to show you now is the real-time speech translation APIs. I'm sure every single one of you have seen Star Trek and the Universal Translator, right? Nobody? Nobody watched Star Trek? You, you're kidding. I thought, I thought there were developers in the audience. OK, so the technology that we're going to show you is the Universal Translator the exact same technology that's built into Skype Translator, but available to you as an API for you to use inside of your applications today. So that's pretty neat. Why might you use that? OK, we did the demo. So why might you use that? So there are a couple of things to think about here. When you think about speech to text, right? you say some words. Um, that gets translated into a set of results. Speech to text has been around for a little while. But when you think about speech to text, it's very commonly being used mostly for commands. You know, say something, get a result back, do something. The API that we, we are releasing now, that is available to you now, is real time conversational speech support. So, what you'll find when somebody is talking to somebody else, maybe in a Skype call or something else, that what they're saying is going to be much longer than the typical kind of uh, speech-to-text uh, type. And there's obviously going to be a lot of meaning and intent that is part of what, what it is that they're saying. So the way the API is built, there are a number of different pieces to it, the first of which is uh, we have a WebSocket endpoint for you to stream PCM audio data to. So as you're speaking, that audio stream will be sent on the WebSocket for the real-time translation service at the back end to start processing over that data, right? On the receiving side, you get two return streams coming back, the first of which is a text-based stream. And this will fire for one of two different result sets. The first one is partial results. So if I'm saying something like, this is a sentence that needs translation, as I'm saying that sentence, I'll be starting to get partial results back from the translation service, right? So I'll get the text stream coming back that I could potentially show to
to the person that wants to see the translation of that so they get a feel for what the conversation is saying even before the final results are available. We also strip out, as you're speaking, some of the most common kind of pauses and ums and ahs and gaps that, that might be um, in the uh, 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 sentence that's being spoken, right? So you just get the, the uh, rectified text being sent back. Not only do we give you partial results, but we also give you full results as well, or final results. So within your, your first callback, you can switch on both partial and final results. Final results are fired when there is a half second gap in the speech stream. That will then generate not only the final text results of the translation, but will also at the same time generate that second return stream, which will be a playable audio stream of the translated voice as well. Okay, that sounds pretty neat, right? Okay, who would like to see a demo of that working? Okay. So what I'm going to do is show you two demos, actually, of this working. The first one, because um, I don't actually speak that many other languages, is going to be doing an incredible translation task of translating English to English. <laughs> OK, so the reason why I'm going to be showing you that is, so this is, this is the code for the application. Actually, let me show you the. UI for the application first. So the UI for the application is super simple. It's got a button. It's got a couple of um, text boxes. What? Oh, sorry. Yes, projector. Yes, my bad. There we go, the UI. <laughs> Much better. OK, so what we'll see inside of the UI is I've got a button that says Capture. Um, I've got an audio input device. Uh, I'm using Windows devices enumeration. I'm sure many of you have used that API to enumerate other hardware devices in the system. I'm using Windows devices enumeration to find all the audio input devices in the system. And for my device, I should find two, one of which is the mic array built into the laptop, and the other one will be a USB headset that's plugged in. Obviously, with the USB headset, I'm going to get much better audio definition than trying to talk to the laptop from a distance. And then what we're going to see when I click the capture button, the, we'll set up the PCM audio stream for streaming the audio to the translator endpoint. And once that's ready to capture audio, we'll see this audio capture status change to the word ready. And then as I'm speaking, we should see both partial and final results being displayed in this field here called output. OK, so let's go to the code. And I'm going to search for the word final. So I mentioned there are two callbacks that get called back from the real-time speech translation API. This is the display result callback. And I'll show you in a second just how this is set up. And you'll see that we get a string sent in as the result from the callback. And I'm simply looking for the tag type as final or partial. And I'm putting that on the front of the translated text that I'm getting back. And then, because it's returned obviously on a different thread, uh, doing a dispatch of run async to then set it up in the UI, right? So, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. So if I put the headset on now, I should be able to run this. And what we should then see when I start this running... Okay, so let's take a look in the com combo box. And we can see I've got my mic array and the headset. So I've got the headset selected. When I click capture, we'll see the audio capture status change. And then I should be able to start speaking. I know I can start speaking. And then we should start to see some output in the output window. If I start speaking, we should see some output in the window. And there we have it, ladies and gentlemen, English to English translation. <laughs> Crowd goes wild at that point. OK, so that's, that part of the demo is, is literally just to show you the partial and final results you're getting back. All right, got it? OK. Right, let's just take a, a little closer look at the code within this application. This is a simplified version 
of the application that John and Ryan have been showing you simply to set up the uh, audio uh, translation piece. Okay, so the button that I clicked, I'm basically just switching the text on the, on the button to either stop or start, and I'm saying capturing audio is either true or false, so I can kind of switch that. Uh, in here, I'm calling start audio capture or stop audio capture. Uh, the audio pipeline is already set up. When the application initializes, I'm, I'm doing all the work to set up the audio input piece to capture the PCM stream. So that's not actually happening here, right? Okay, so we connect to the speech translation service. I've got a class that I've created, uh, which is called the speech translate client. And I connect, and what I'm passing in is the language to and from, which in, in this case is hard-coded uh, for English to English translation, right? So I've hard-coded it here. Uh, in reality, you would probably want to provide the user with some ability to select the, the to and from language. Uh, based on profile or, or something else, right? Uh, then the other thing that I'm passing in is the two output streams, right? The two callbacks, one of which is for the text result that we've already seen, and the other one is for the audio stream return, which will be the translated audio, which in this case would have been the, uh, you know, whatever it was I said, now some text appearing in the window or something like that. Okay, so uh, after that, we can obviously go dig in and take a look at the speech translate client software, and that's where we're kind of making the calls out to the speech translation API. But I think, given that we've only got a few minutes left, and we'll post the code online so you can go take a look at it, it would be way more interesting for us to do something incredibly clever, which would be to take the application that John and Ryan have built and make sure that I'm on the headset here. And uh, rather than typing something to search, it'll be way more interesting to find somebody in the audience that speaks a language other than English, have them come up here and speak something as a search phrase, put that into Ryan's Lewis model to then search for whatever it is that they've said, and then take the results of that and drop it into John's search model to give us the results back into the application. Would that be the most amazingly cool thing that you've ever seen? <laughs> Hang on, it hasn't worked yet. Okay, so do we have anybody in the audience that speaks a language other than English? Uh, so we've got a few hands going up. I'll pick the guy in the blue shirt here that I've never met before. Chris, why don't you come up onto the stage? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, um, okay. So, headset, and it, this is the exact same code that we saw in the simple translate, uh, the, the English to English translation. Uh, so I'm gonna hit the uh, microphone button here, which is the start button that we saw in the previous app, and when this says ready in the text next to the microphone, then Chris will be able to speak in which language? German. In German, and then that'll be hopefully translated into English, and then we'll pass that into the Lewis model, and then from the Lewis model into search, and then we should see the results uh, in the output. So, here we go. Zeiging a Bilder von Lila Kühen, bitte. So I'm assuming he was searching for purple cows. <laughs> okay, so there we have it. In the last hour, we've taken you on a bit of a journey. We've taken you through the process of using the Bing search APIs to search for web results, news results, images, and videos. Uh, we've also added Lewis support into that application to give you the ability to add natural language processing into the application, as, as well as taking a look at the image tagging APIs as well. And then finally, we've shown you how to add text translation support into your application, and then fast forwarding your applications by 200 years by adding the real-time voice translation service into your application as well. 
So at the end, I'd like to point you at a URL for you to get more information. Uh, we're going to be around for a few minutes if you have any questions. And at that point, thank you very much.